I'm not ashamed. What do we learn about regular worship in Israel following the Ark of the Covenant coming to Jerusalem? This is the question we seek to answer today as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of 1 Chronicles on Walking Through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 37 to 43. But before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 37. But if you don't have a Bible, don't worry, just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So 1 Chronicles chapter 16, beginning at verse 37. So he left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister before the Ark regularly as every day's work required. And Obed-Edom with his 68 brethren, including Obed-Edom the son of Jethudan and Hosa to be the gatekeepers. And Zadok the priest and his brethren the priest before the tabernacle of the Lord at the high place that was at Gibeon to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offering regularly morning and evening and to do according to all that is written in the law of the Lord, which he commanded Israel. And with them, Heman and Jethunan and the rest were who were chosen, who were designated by name, to give thanks to the Lord, because his mercy endures forever. And with them, Heden, Heman and Jethunan, uh, to sound aloud with trumpets and cymbals and the musical instruments of God. Now the sons of Jethunan were gatekeepers. Then all the children, uh, then all the people departed, every man to his house, and David returned to bless his house. Chapters 15 and 16 have been detailing to us how the Ark of the Covenant came to Jerusalem. Of course, this was the successful attempt, as chapter 13 chronicled for us the unsuccessful attempt that resulted in the death of Uzzah. The Ark was placed not in the tabernacle that Moses made, but in one that David had erected in Jerusalem while the rest of the tabernacle was still at Gibeon. We noted that David must have done this with God's approval, otherwise it is safe to conclude that God would have struck someone else dead for their disobedience. But we don't read of God's authority. True. But we don't read of every command that God ever gave Israel either, though from the results we know God gave the command. Remember, this was the time of the prophets, the time when God spoke directly to man. We do not have every prophet's prophecy, but we know they spoke. Nathan was a prophet at this time, and so it is very likely that God used Nathan to communicate this to David. Whatever the case, the ark is now in Jerusalem, a momentous occasion for Israel and for David. For now that which represented the very presence of God was now in Israel's capital, and God was able to be worshipped in, in, in its presence. And that's exactly what we've been covering the last two lessons through the psalm that David wrote for Asaph to sing in the tabernacle in Jerusalem. It was a psalm of praise, honor, and glory for the faithfulness of the one true God of the universe, as well as a psalm of thanksgiving for all that God had done for Israel and for David up until that point. God was the ruler of this universe, the savior of all mankind by grace through faith, and yet, even with all this being true, God still had turned his eye towards Israel and towards David. He had blessed them just as he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would. He had fulfilled every last promise that he made to them. And his work was still not done, because the Messiah was still a promise that as of yet had not been fulfilled. David recognized all of this and contrasted God's power with the lack of power of the idols that other nations worshipped. With the idols that Israel had a habit of worshipping as well. Things just couldn't compare. Those idols were nothing. They accomplished nothing. And the hope that people placed in them was useless. On the other hand, God was alive. He was powerful. He was in control. And he was one who kept his word. Thus, the one who placed his trust in him would have as a guarantee that which was promised. For us today, we often can slip into the mindset of doubting God. After all, we haven't seen him face to face. We haven't talked to him directly in that he's answered in our ears. Sure, we have the scriptures, but they were written 2,000 plus years ago. Could they really be re relevant in the 21st century? In saying this, though, we forget that the people of scripture dealt with many of the same situations that we do. Yes, David had prophets, but that was simply the word of the Lord, what we would have today recorded as scripture. David didn't get direct messages from God where David spoke to God like Moses did. 
David prayed like we pray. David sang songs of praise like we sing. David had to have faith like we have to have faith. David was not saved because he saw the face of God. He was saved because he saw the actions of God, placed his faith on God, and did what God asked of him through what was revealed to him in the law and by the prophets. God asks of us to do the same. Examine the scriptures. Test the spirits. See what God has done not only in the past but in your life too, for he has done something. And place your faith in God and his son Jesus Christ by obeying what he has revealed to us in the Bible and specifically the New Testament. David never doubted the faithfulness of God, and neither should we. With this psalm now concluded, we learn that the worship in Israel will temporarily change, not in substance really, but in location. As we said earlier, the tabernacle of Moses and the Ark of the Covenant, which had one time been together, were now separated. The Ark is in Jerusalem, while the tabernacle of Moses was about 10 kilometers or 6 miles north in Gibeon. But instead of immediately reuniting them, God chose to keep them separate until the temple would be built in the days of Solomon. Why he did this, we're not entirely sure, but it could very well be that there was not enough room in the small city that Jerusalem was at that time to house the tabernacle and all that went on there. Regardless, Asaph and his brethren would minister before the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem with their jobs being singing in worship. And even though it is not mentioned here, it is also likely from our study of 2 Samuel that Abiathar, who was also high priest, was in charge of supervising everything here so as to ensure that the proper order was maintained. As Asaph was not a priest, though, that meant that he wouldn't be offering any sacrifices, nor were sacrifices offered in Jerusalem, save perhaps on the Day of Atonement. Those sacrifices would be offered where the altar of burnt offering was, which was at Gibeon. Zadok, the high priest, as well as the other priests, would minister there. Others among the Levites would also serve as gatekeepers and in other functions in both, tabernacle, in both tabernacles, ensuring that the regular worship of Israel, though for a time irregular until the temple was built, was maintained according to the will of God. Speaking of the temple, in chapter 17, we're going to discuss David's desire to build it and what God's response to that will be. So we hope that you will turn for that. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of First Chronicles chapter 17, verses 1 to 15, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I am not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Amen.